your students ready to become the engaged and informed citizens our democracy needs right now. Your classroom can be a place for them to experience what it means to live in community with others, overcome differences, and to ask questions. Today on the podcast, we're joined by Mary Aaronworth, Pablo Wolf, and Mark Topp, co-authors of The Civically Engaged Classroom, Reading, Writing, and Speaking for Change. Their book offers strategies and lessons for facilitating civic engagement that you can use in your classroom immediately. They believe that the work of engaging young people isn't about giving students a voice. They already have their own voices. The work is about teaching them to use those voices with power. Thank you all for joining me here today. I'm so excited to talk about your brand new book, The Civically Engaged Classroom. In the opening of the book, you write about all the challenges that our students are facing today in society and that education has never been as important as it is right now. So what kind of challenges are you noticing that led you to write this book? This is Mark. We wrote this book way, way before the um, election was happening. So we wrote this book with the election in mind. And the challenges at that time, we were thinking just about how unjust our country seemed and how unfair it seemed. And as we began to write this, the border crisis from last fall began to take shape where we saw families being separated and children being locked up. So we began to see how our society um, began to crack apart. And then COVID came and we really saw how that crack widened um, against um, the people in our country, I guess the citizens of our country and how leadership just lacked. So we wrote this book initially to talk about um, civic engagement in our students. And as the months went on, we realized what a necessity it is for students to do something about it right now. Because school is where they can learn to come together, right? School is where we can help them overcome this fear to feel safe, to connect with each other, and to name some problems, to discuss some problems, and to research some problems on both sides. It's really about having our classrooms become political places where topics can be discussed and investigated and that research behind those topics can be looked at and discerned for just the perspective and the values behind that. I think that one thing that came up early on that I was really struck by Pablo that you brought into was this notion that it wasn't that we were interested in teaching kids or teachers who to vote for but it is to try to teach kids in such a way that they will become voters, that they will right. you know, become the kind of citizens who vote. And we're real, we are concerned about that. You look at the last election, the people who didn't vote were young people, you know, and, and also people who um, had traditionally been disenfranchised. So, you know, so that we want to make sure that that's changed. I mean, the power imbalance is so unfair in this country. And part of that can start in school. So that was, that was another thing. I mean, Pablo, what would you add? I mean, I would say that, you know, the, the challenges facing our kids are just innumerable. It's, it's really an unprecedented time for them right now. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really threatening them is that the public discourse uh, threatens many of their identities. We have, you know, so many kids feel, you know, attacked by uh, those who are in power right now. And uh, whether you're Mexican, whether you're Black, whether you're, uh, whether you're gay, I mean, there's so many uh, identities that are attacked. I think second... Kids are in despair of the global challenges that are in the world right now, whether they're questions of race or climate change or pandemic. Um, there's a lot of anxiety around that. I think there's also lost time uh, for socialization with peers because of the pandemic and distance learning. And it's, that's affecting kids, too. Um, and I think on top of all these challenges, kids are asking, like, so what's the point of school? What's the utility of school in the face of all of these challenges? And I think the answer to that is civic engagement. I think the answer to that is what we kind of are prescribing in this book. If you're going to respond to all those myriad challenges, the only way to do that is to connect with each other. And that's the essence of civic engagement. You know, we've all been so lucky to be able to witness this student-led activism that's popping up right now. So what can educators do to support students in that work? This is Pablo again. 
you know, I suspect a lot of those great uh, leaders that we think about, like Greta Thunberg or, you know, Malala, you know, and then some of the, uh, the kids in, uh, in Florida as well in response to, um, to the gun violence in schools. Uh, unfortunately, I think they do their activism in spite of school, you know, not with the help of school. I think that school can be a distraction for them. And so it's actually something that they're taking on on their own. And I think one of the things that teachers can do is realize that promoting the activism of their students has to be done with them and it can't be forced on them. It's about creating uh, civic actions together with kids. Um, and it means radically rethinking the way we interact with our students, I think. Often we're, we're proposing a course of action that may not be the one the kids would prefer to do. And so we have to figure out how to do things in consort with them. And I think, you know, one of the things I learned from Kathleen Tolan is get out of the kid's way, right? So we have to learn ways to guide students, but not get in their way and take example from some of these activists that you mentioned. That makes me think of, as a classroom teacher, we just have to provide that space for them to gather, to meet, to discuss, and to not judge, and to be in that room and just listen to them and have them listen to each other so that they can have those conversations. And it's not about giving them answers, but also if they're attacking these big issues at a young age, maybe listing out some possibilities, raising their language and raising their awareness. And um, any time that you can share anything that inspires you or an activist, someone speaking out, amplify that experience in your classroom for your students, for them to see not only that, but to see you respond to that bravery and that change. This is Mary. I think, Mark, too, just listening to what you were just saying about um, introducing big controversial issues inside your classroom, that is, I think, a thing that sometimes teachers were afraid to do in our classrooms. This sense that, like, well, we can't do that in school because people are going to really disagree. Or we can't do that in school because it's an issue that people are going to be on different sides of. Whereas, in fact, like school is the place where we want to help kids develop civil discourse. I mean, you look at some of our political leaders now, and I'm like, who were your teachers? Like, because right. you have not learned civil discourse, or maybe you rejected what they learned, but they needed more practice. Like, they need more practice. Um, and we want that. We want kids to be able to see things in really different ways and, but, and be able to talk about that and still be able to, to, to listen. So a big part of what we do in the book, which I actually am really proud of is, I feel like all three of us, Pablo and I have written together, Mark and I have written together before. And before this, we'd done quite a bit of work with argumentation, where a lot of it was about learning how to help kids have logical arguments. And I think in this book, we did a lot more with inside of, of argumentation, learning to listen, to be radical listeners. And I think that is really huge um, that to, for kids to be engaged in social action, they also have to be able to listen, to be able to, to hear other viewpoints and perspectives so that they're, they're building their own from a sort of more informed perspective. And they're also just more humane. Like they're just like, you know, people listen to you more when you also listen. And I, I appreciate both your points because you guys made such a, uh, an important case there for the role that school plays in building our young citizens. Um, I, th- I don't think that as a society we can rely solely on kids learning civic virtues and responsibilities at home. That schools have a role to play in helping them develop those skills. And I think that's extremely important. Yeah, Mary, you know, I like that you brought up how logic and argumentation often doesn't create a whole lot of space for listening. And it often doesn't create a whole lot of space for identity and lived experience. And all three of those pieces are a big part of your book. So to be an engaged citizen like we want our students to be, why is it important to start with exploring our own identities and our biases? Yeah, and I think there's there's two people that I think we should probably mention that we feel really indebted to in their thinking or that we're apprenticed to, actually, literally in our thinking. And one is Sara Ahmed, who's written Being the Change. And she did some, you know, just stunning work with helping kids do some identity mapping. And she was at Teachers College when we were just in the midst of writing this book and we got to talk with her. And one of the things she said, which we were so struck by, is she said that every day as the news breaks, kids and families in your classroom will experience it differently based on their identities. And we were so struck by that, that 
that that is something that sometimes school doesn't acknowledge. And what we took from that is not just breaking news, but also curriculum, that kids are going to experience the curriculum differently because of their identities, because of their histories and their cultures and their backgrounds. And that school traditionally hasn't made any room for that. And I think the older kids get in school, the less room there is made for that, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time you get to be taking like AP or IB courses, there, there literally is no room for you in the curriculum. And I think about like when um, uh, the Common Core Standards came out and uh, David Coleman, who was one of the authors of the standards, I mean, he literally got up on stage and when asked about the Common Core Standards, which he said, the thing I want to teach kids is that nobody gives a shit about you. That was what he wanted to teach. He was like, nobody gives a shit about your life. That was his national quote that was on the national news. I was like, that's you think what the purpose of education is, which is, I'm sorry, but it's such an elitist point of view. Easy for you to say with your Ivy League degree and your, you know, your Rhodes Scholarship to say that you want to teach a whole generation of kids that nobody gives a shit about their lives. So we wanted to make sure that school is the opposite of that, that we wanted to have a place that school becomes a place where there's the curriculum that you plan and then that the kids are also the curriculum and that there's intersection between those two. And then the other person that we feel apprenticed to is Bettina Love, who, you know, she, of course, wrote We Want to Do More Than Survive about abolitionist teaching. But she recently gave this amazing talk. Um, It was a webinar she did with Penn. And she talked there a little bit about how um, school is a place where not all kids are allowed to thrive. And she was begging teachers that when we come back from COVID, to not actually go back to business as usual because business as usual was not a place where all kids got to thrive. So one of the things we try in the book, probably you can talk more about this, but I feel like we wanted to do a lot of work with kids getting a chance to both explore their identities and then have their identities affirmed. And then Pablo really pushed us to make sure that that was work we did with adults as well. So Pablo, maybe do you want to talk about that for a second? Because I feel like that was something that you really pushed us towards. I mean, I think the, the, Flip side, well, one, I'm always an advocate for teachers doing whatever they're asking their kids to do. Um, you know, if it's important enough for the kids to do, then we, we have to take it on ourselves um, and, and see how it affects us. So I think it's important for us to think about who we are um, and what uh, we bring into the classroom. And that includes, I mean, of course, it's the, all the beauty that we bring from our own life experiences and the groups that we are a part of. Uh, but then it also brings the biases that, that are part of us too. Um, the flip side of any identity work is also bias work. Because of the groups we affiliate with, we also have perceptions of other groups. So it's important to unpack that as well. And I think we want to think as educators going into the classroom, what is it that's part of my identity that's beautiful, that's great, that's going to be enriching for my students to be exposed to. But then on the other hand, what does my identity, what are some of the biases that come with the particular identity I have? And how are those biases going to play out in the space that I'm creating with my kids? Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about when you guys, when you did the Harvard Implicit Bias Project a little bit? Because Yes, um, trying this workout with students was a little bit shocking, even though we had a safe space. Just when you realize that um, there are biases within you, just that realization is hard. It's hard for adults, and it's really shocking for children because they we were told that we are all inclusive. We are in New York, we are an inclusive school, but really realizing there's biases towards other people. And in one case, um, there's biases against who we are as a person. So this inner judgment of ourselves is a huge thing Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. students to uncover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by uncovering it early, then it can come out and then we have tools to deal with it, right? So it's no longer, we're learning who we are we're learning who you are. Um, so I'm learning who I'm learning who I am, but I'm also learning along with you. So I learn a little bit more of myself too. Yeah, Mark, you know, I really appreciate that you name how discovering that we have our own biases can be really alarming and um, upsetting. And throughout the book, it's mentioned quite a bit that discomfort is necessary. Uh, you even write that distress is better than ignorance. So why is leaning into this discomfort so important? That's one of the premises of the book. Um, it, it's interesting when Bettina was giving this um, this talk the other day at, at Penn, she talked about the concept of, she was talking about anti-racism and about what's a, a concept that has come up, which is ally fatigue, which is when, you know, for instance, straight allies of people who are, 
are trying to get LGBTQ rights or people who are white trying to be allies. And she, she brought up ally fatigue and she just was like, you know, that's not okay. It's not okay to have ally fatigue. It's not okay. Like, because when you think about like our kids of color, they don't get to opt out of racism. So, you know, that means those of us who are white don't get to opt out of anti-racism. Um, and I think that that sense that it's going to be uncomfortable, it is going to be uncomfortable because we don't all experience the world in the same ways. And because we are living in, you know, the air we breathe is full of racism. The air we breathe is full of sexism. The air we breathe is full of homophobia. So we took that to heart of what, you know, Kendi says about that you can't, you can't escape those oppressions. They are all around you and we internalize them. Um, and so like Mark was saying, it's really uncomfortable. I mean, I have a great colleague, Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, who calls me on, you know, she's like, calls me on my shit sometimes. And it's like, it's really uncomfortable and I'm so grateful to her. You know, it's painful in the moment, but I'm so grateful to her that she has the, the, the care and the candor to say to me, like, Mary, this thing you just said, it's, you know, this is, I could be perceived as a microaggression. And when you first try to do that in your workplace with colleagues, or it's really uncomfortable. Um, and so we did find that one of the easier ways to start is by looking at text, for instance. Like, so you're looking at, you know, you're looking at books and you're looking at articles. I mean, all you got to do is pick out a bunch of the books that kids have in their library on westward expansion or on exploration. And like, they are so full of, uh, you know, a white privileged bias that, you know, you don't have to look very deeply to see it. Um, and then that lets you go from there to other places where it's, you know, it's less comfortable. Um, but sadly, you know, the, the texts that are in our history classrooms are just so full of not implicit bias, but explicit bias, that that in a way is, I think, Mark, like, maybe you can talk to that, because I feel like you get your kids acculturated to thinking about bias by first looking at it in text, too. And then right. in a way that helps them think of ourselves as a text. Do you, do you want to say something about that, maybe? Absolutely. It's, it's just anytime we're looking at a text ourselves, um, if you're honest, it becomes real. And if, when it's real, then they, students will realize how brave it is. And there's, some, there's a beauty in danger because danger becomes honest. And when our things are honest, you can really do some self-discovery or some discovery within the text. There's also some healing because what has been implicit or unspoken has been named. So there's some healing that takes place and it's also thought provoking and it's world expanding. And students really, I feel like, become empowered. It becomes electric and they finally seek this new purpose. It's not being vessels for information, but it really it's becoming agents of naming some change that they can see of themselves or not see in the text. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's like, they can teach the text something or the author something or the publisher something, which is really powerful for a seventh grader. I think that you guys mentioned how to do that work with texts. I think it's also important for us to assess um, or self-assess in our interactions with students as well um, and check ourselves when biases come out and give opportunities for difficult conversations to take place in our classrooms or or outside of our classrooms in spare time mm -hmm. that we might have with the kids. I mean, I remember last year, I was a, a dean of instruction and then also a teacher at a school that was 99% black students. And uh, I had an interaction in the lunchroom uh, with a group of girls uh, and they were, it was at the end of lunch and it was a time where we were supposed to all be quiet and so we could announce which tables were dismissing to what rooms and that sort of thing. So everyone had to be silent. And so it was a group of girls <laughs> and they were all rowdy and they were still talking and they're being loud. And um, they were, they, some of them had thrown food at each other. And um, janitor, the maintenance man, uh, Mr. Charlie, he saw all the food on the floor. And Mr. Charlie is black as well, but he saw all the food and he was so angry that, that they had thrown all the food. And I was so angry because the students weren't listening to my silent signal to get everyone to be quiet <laughs> and they'd thrown food. And so I was angry at the students and they were angry at me for coming over and trying to like reprimand them. And Mr. Charlie and I walked over together and Mr. Charlie says, you all are animals. And he says it to them. And again, granted, it's coming from a black man, but I was closely associated with him as who they perceived to be a white man right next to them. And their anger at being called that word and their anger at seeing me with Mr. Charlie push the table forcefully out of the way so we could clean up the mess that was on the floor. I think they associated that kind of language with me uh, and with the racial 
weight that that word carries. Um, and it was a very tense and fraught moment. We cleaned the mess up and I felt like we had to talk about it. So I sat, sat with the girls, um, there were four of them, and we went up to my classroom and we sat down and we started to talk about that situation and what had transpired and how they felt, not only in that moment, but also in my classroom. And in that conversation, there were things that came out that made me realize that I was sending signals in my room that I didn't even, wasn't even aware of. And mm -hmm. I wasn't listening to the signals they were giving back to me. So some things that came out, um, one girl said, you know, um, you take things too personally. So um, mm -hmm. you move too fast. Um, Sometimes I'm not even sure what, how to do your work and trying to unpack your work was interesting for me because it's something I was doing was making the assignments that we were doing together, not together. It was me imposing something on them. And so in that conversation, I, was, I had to do a lot of listening. I, I could picture my face getting red. I had to hold back, like not saying, well, but you guys have to listen better and stuff like that. I had to take it. And it was a difficult conversation, definitely uncomfortable and it made me a much better teacher and it made me much better administrator and it made it possible for me to write with more honesty in this book, I think. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of situations that we have to put ourselves in. It was a really powerful thing you two, you were saying. It relates actually to Pablo's story of not treating kids like they're empty vessels, but that they can be empowered to, mm -hmm. you know, to both express their identities and, and change them and grow as well in school. Right. And maybe that's related a little bit to really our theories, because it's, it's a major paradigm shift to think that our job isn't to fill kids up with information, but to help them develop the skills to be able to build their own knowledge um, you know, from a lot of different sources. And so, Mark, do you want to talk maybe a little bit about that? Because that's been a really big part of our work as well. Absolutely. And I think it has a lot to do many ways, Mary, with this identity work, but the, here we're talking about academic identities. So kids are either successful or they seem to not. So when, you, when kids become an age, um, they think smart is happening because it's just who you are, or they begin to peg themselves as I'm not smart. So they have this social identity of who they can be friends with and how to act, it's very separate if we talk about their academic I identity. So it's no longer about what they do know or don't know, it's what they do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that information has not been shared with them. So like whether it's like approaching a topic and pulling a certain group aside saying, students that get ahead know something about the topic before they begin class. So it pays a lot to do some research really quickly to understand um, what we are studying before we begin the unit. The importance of background knowledge is huge. You talk about it a lot in the book. How can we prepare students to check sources and be mindful of their reading so that they really go into these conversations with some good grounding? I guess it's a switch from making sure they understand content to how they approach content. So if they're going to, it's not so much what they know, but what they do to understand what they know so that they can go to eighth grade and high school and college and graduate school, knowing that before they get to class, they can start researching then. Or that in addition to reading from a text on their own, they can search out some primary sources and instead of waiting for someone to explain what this primary source is, you can begin to um, read that primary source for yourself. It's letting them know that um, as they consume media, that the media really is in charge of them and they can slow things down and they can be in charge of that media and the text that they read. Just knowing that if they do a little research on the author or organization that's putting out that information, if they start to look for connotative language. So they get the sense of the bias of the author. And if they're looking at the bias of the author, if they're looking at their own biases, they can lay out their research. I have all this research that confirms what I know. I don't have anything that, that challenges me or challenges my thinking. So letting them be aware of that, which is a game changer for them, so they can search out both sides of an argument 
or even find the neutrality of an argument. So that way, like the um, other topic, so that next time they go on, they can begin to, this is a neutral source. I'm going to look out on a, a very conservative source. I'm going to look out on a liberal source for this. I'm going to look out for arguments inside of what's happening and research both sides. Yeah, Mark, I worked with a teacher this morning in Barcelona. He teaches IB history, and he mm -hmm. said he's doing a study with a professor out of Harvard, who, and I think, I think Stanford, who's teaching him the term lateral reading, and I really like that. The note, and it was the same the thing that um, rather than saying that you try to do what we used to do is like, can you validate this website? And he's like, that doesn't work anymore. Like anybody can get a .org, any can make a anybody can make a website look valid, and instead. Mm -hmm to just read laterally, to say instead of reading one thing, I'm gonna read eight things, or instead of reading one thing, I'm gonna read four things. And just that notion of comparing across texts. And I think that's one thing that we try to help teachers with in the book is that rather than have kids just surfing the internet, that it's helpful for the classes we're teaching and the, the curriculum we're designing to develop kind of starter sets for texts. Of right. like starter sets. And, and the, the challenge inside of that, which maybe probably you could talk about, is that even we, you know, we end up wanting to put 16 sources that are all what I think. <laughs> you know, it's so easy to have confirmation bias, even in the, in the text sets that we build, which, I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about that, Pablo? Because I feel like that's, that's challenging. It's definitely challenging um, to come up with texts that complement each other and that, that provide uh, a number of different perspectives on uh, an event or on a, an issue. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's tough to do, but it, it can be done and you have to be just conscious of it. And we give some suggestions on how to do that in the book. I think the, the point again and again that Mark and Mary both made is, is about reading a lot. You know, we have to make sure that we're not giving them one source, but several that at the very least we're triangulating with a couple of different sources to see what they have in common and to see what they disagree on. So I think that's really important. I just want to make one point that we talk heavily about text. Um, it's not the only way for us to build background knowledge. Um, you know, depending on what we're trying to do uh, as a class, we might rely a lot on interviews or mm -hmm. on uh, conversations with people in our community, for example. Um, I had a really rich experience with some students in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, two years ago, and they were led by a very capable teacher, and uh, his name's Akeem Barnes, and uh, they, he was assisted by a, a community activist and organizer, uh, Aaron Hinton, and um, they did some beautiful work with trying to understand how the police were interacting with the students in that community. And their background information came from surveys that they conducted. They designed the survey, and then they took that survey out to the streets and they talk to people directly. And so their sources were community members. And so rather than thinking of the community as something that has to be studied from afar, it's like, actually, there's great knowledge right here. Let's mm -hmm. go and, and harness that. Mm -hmm. And so the kids didn't just talk to one or two members of their community. They talked to 200. So mm -hmm. they really went deep and uh, 200 different uh, pieces of uh, data that they could actually then show to the police department and say, look, this percentage of people don't know that they have recourse if you do something wrong. So how can we get them to know that there's an actual uh, mechanism for them to complain about problems with policing? So it actually became a tool that was really powerful. So I just think that background knowledge, we have to remember that the communities around our schools are rich in background knowledge, that parents are rich in background knowledge too, and that we have to honor that and give kids uh, the permission, because sometimes they need that permission for us, from us to, uh, to tap it. Pablo, that feels really important. And it's making me think about, do you remember um, when Gloria Ladson Billings came out with the Dream Keepers, um, where she wanted us to shift the emphasis from kids always having to learn from us to also us learning more about kids' families and their histories and their cultures. And like the, the notion that background knowledge should be multidirectional. Like we, we also need to be building more knowledge and reaching out to find out more and to, so that we can, we, can, we can teach better, you know, that we can teach with better relationships and better knowledge and more celebrating and affirming of kids' identities. But I am really struck by what you said also about in the community also there are these deep pools. That's mm -hmm. really beautiful. And there's family communication, which is really interesting too, because if a student goes home and begins to have an academic conversation with their family about what they've learned, right? That's a game changer for families, yeah. right? So then that's when they can start moving, talking about ideas and issues. And what did you do in school today, right? 
I know that becomes relevant. I mean, as someone who's raised two teenagers, um, the notion of like, you're like, how was school? And they're like, fine. Oh, mm -hmm. fine. Which I can see it's like fine covers a myriad of who knows what the hell that means. Um, so right. the notion of like that kids start to find school actually relevant is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that notion like Pablo that in Brownsville where your kids were, were taking up an issue in the community, the community was suffering from. So if they're going to go home and talk about trying to change the way that the police interact with their local community and with themselves, that's really relevant to everybody in, that, in the family, to all, of, to all of us and to everyone versus, you know, I want to talk to you about my quiz on the American Revolution. So that mm -hmm. I think is on us is to shift the curriculum too. So the curriculum is actually socially relevant to the lives that kids are living. Well, and if we want to think about, you know, the time that we're in right now, I think we'll all agree. And I think our listeners will agree too, that the social fabric is torn and that, you know, there are tremendous div divides in this country. And I think as educators, if we want to magnify our impact in trying to bring that stitch, that fabric back together, we can't just be thinking of ourselves as doing something active in just our classroom and just having it freeze there. If we want to magnify our impact, we have to think about how do we reach out into the dinner table conversations that kids have mm -hmm. with their parents and mm -hmm. the uh, conversations they have with their friends and their neighbors in the street. That's what civic consciousness is about. It can't stop in just the bubble of the class. It has to magnify outwards and radiate outwards in order for it to make the impact that we want it to make. Okay. That's the beauty of this time, right? This, it is a time of change. Yeah, it's the pain so of the time. Time, Right, so I mean, there's like inside this, this is, it's that time of change that we can have these conversations and that something needs to happen mm -hmm. and they need someone, we're looking for leaders. We're looking for people to name these problems, to talk about these problems and do it, not maybe at such a grand level, but things can change, things can improve, mm -hmm. and that students can be a part of it because mm -hmm. certainly adults <laughs> don't know how to solve some things. These models around, you know, there's, there's just models around where adults just have failed and it's clear to their adults in their lives. So now that is this moment of change for them to take charge that is really powerful. Yeah, yeah, well, that's like the Parkland kids. I mean, and that's yeah. all the kids are taking up climate change. They're like, the world that we're making isn't good enough. And that, that does give you great hope for helping harness that inside the classroom. And also, um, like you said, Pablo, in the beginning, like, what are the things we can do that can help kids come out of school even stronger and with more powerful voices? So before we wrap up, um, I just wanted to draw attention again to the title of the book, which again is, of course, The Civically Engaged Classroom. So what are the conditions of a civically engaged classroom? Um, how would we know one when we see one? This is Pablo again. Uh, I think the conditions of a civically engaged classroom, there, there are several. Um, one of them is, has to do with belief in power to change systems um, and to expose oppression. I, I think if our classroom is going to go out and do something in the world, it first has to believe that it can. And I think that radiates from the teacher communicating to kids that they believe in them and they're listening to them. And then that can then magnify and grow outward. Um, so I think that's one belief that you can actually change something. Um, so it, it calls on you to be an optimist. Um, I think uh, second condition, social networks are really powerful and important. And I don't mean, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn or whatever. I mean, uh, social networks in terms of our community ties and knowing and taking stock of the value of those uh, connections that radiate outward from a school is really important. I think third, uh, if we're going to have uh, a really civically engaged class, you need to have access to materials, books, texts, technology. Those kinds of things are really important because they allow us to, to connect and to understand the context that we're in. We also need the strategies and skills that are important to be literate people. Um, those are skills that we talk a lot about in the book that we work on all the time in our writing and reading workshops. Um, but we have to have those literacy skills that allow us to access texts. Another condition, a fourth condition is, uh, or a fifth condition, the classroom has to have a culture of care and of respect. If you're going to do any of this work and uh, take these kinds of risks that we're asking you to take, uh, the kids have to listen to each other. They have to value each other and they have to, and value you as well. Um, and so you have to have that kind of culture in your classroom. I think we also need to have another condition that's important is an awareness of uh, oppression in the world and injustice in the world. You have to be open to the fact that things aren't fair. I think 
if you're going to do anything that's going to be valid in connecting to others, you have to acknowledge that. And then understanding that we not only have rights to um, take advantage of in this country, we also have responsibilities. And I think the teachers need to understand the responsibilities that they have as, uh, as citizens, but the kids do need to know their responsibilities too. And that's incredibly important to think about what am I giving back to, to my community? And then the last one that I would say is, is uh, love. <laughs> I mean, it sounds so, just so corny, uh, but it's absolutely imperative that there be a feeling of you're doing this because you love the kids that are in your room and that you, uh, you love the communities that they're part of. And that has to be reciprocal for uh, your classroom to be really civically engaged. My thanks to Mary, Pablo, and Mark for their time today. Their new book, The Civically Engaged Classroom, is available now from Heinemann.com. You can learn more and download a sample chapter at blog.heinemann.com. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George. Sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening.